I'm Dr. Josh Reicher, Doctoral Core Faculty at the American College of Education, and this tutorial is an overview of statistical tests and hypothesis testing. The essential elements for this tutorial include basic types of statistical tests, hypothesis testing, critical values and p-values, sampling errors, power, types 1 and 2 errors, and performing and interpreting a test. What are statistical tests? Statistical tests help us make comparisons and identify relationships between variables in our data. Different tests are used for different purposes and under different conditions, and we have to know which tests to use under which conditions. To determine what kind of test we need to use, there are particular questions we must ask. Number one, what are my hypotheses actually testing? In other words, what is it we're trying to actually determine by using statistics? Number two, what level of data does my instrument use? And we talked about the levels of data or levels of measurement in the previous tutorial expressed as NOIR, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio data. Number three, are my data normally distributed? We also discussed normal distributions in the previous tutorial. Number four, what effect size is required for the test I am choosing? And number five, what is the minimum p-value required to reject a null hypothesis? And we will talk about power and effect and p-values in this tutorial. When stating hypotheses, it's important to remember that the burden of proof is on us. In other words, we're making a conjecture about the population based on a sample, and it's up to us to disprove that the prevailing assumption is not the case. And that's why we state a null hypothesis. And I know that this may be a bit counterintuitive, but hopefully you'll see why it's important in terms of 
uh, the research process. So in statistical testing, we state both a null and alternate hypothesis, and these are expressed as H0 and HA, subscripted. So for example, based on some of my own research where I've used the Durell instrument to measure religiosity, we could state a null and alternate hypothesis like this. The null hypothesis would be there is no statistically significant difference in organizational religiosity scores between teachers and administrators in the given sample. The alternate hypothesis would be there is a statistically significant difference in organizational religiosity scores between teachers and administrators in the given sample. So our objective is to see if we can reject the null hypothesis. And by rejecting the null hypothesis, then there's a suggestion that the alternate hypothesis may be true. The idea of using a null hypothesis may seem silly or unnecessary to you, but there actually is some good reason behind it. What we're doing with a null hypothesis is asking if our sample data actually represent the population for the given hypothesis, or if they only represent sampling errors. In other words, I have this sample, I've given them a survey, perhaps in our example, the Durell instrument, and I've calculated organizational religiosity, and now I want to know whether or not the organizational religiosity between these two subgroups is actually representative of the entire population. So given we're conducting the research, the prevailing assumption is our hypothesis about the population is false. In other words, no one has demonstrated otherwise. So as of right now, there's no one who has suggested that there is a statistically significant difference in organizational religiosity between these two groups. The prevailing assumption is that our hypothesis about that population is false. It's up to us to reject the null hypothesis, not necessarily to prove the alternate hypothesis, but by rejecting the null hypothesis, we can accept the alternate hypothesis. The important thing to remember here is the burden of proof is on us. We're making a conjecture about people's behavior in social science research. We're making an educated guess with our hypothesis. And so what we actually have to do is reject that it's not the case in order to accept the alternate hypothesis that it is in fact the case. When we use statistical tests and test hypotheses, there are two things we need to take into consideration critical values, and the p-value. When we use a statistical test, critical values depend on the test, but generally are based on an alpha value of 0.05, which means the null hypothesis is rejected only 5% of the time when it's actually true. We can say then we have 95% accuracy. So this is pretty much the prevailing number for most statistical tests, a critical value of 95% accuracy. The p-value is the probability that the statistical test is true. A small p-value, generally less than 0.05, indicates that the null hypothesis is false. The smaller the p-value, the more confidence we can have in the rejection of the null hypothesis, meaning uh, the closer to 100% accuracy we come on our critical value means that our p-value is shrinking. P-values are the simplest result in statistical testing. And as we get into conducting these statistical tests, you'll see that the software, and in the case of OGS, we use Winx, uh, the statistical tests will compute a P-value. And that P-value represents how statistically significant uh, the results are. And by and large, if the test reports that P is less than 0.05, we can say that we reject the null hypothesis, and in so doing, the alternate hypothesis is accepted. We need to know in advance how small of a p-value is required to reject the test we're using, but by and large, it's generally p is less than 0.05, and for social science research, uh, it would not be much smaller than that in any case. Um, in things like clinical trials for uh, pharmaceutical research, uh, there, there might be a smaller p-value required or a, a greater 
critical value. That is, we may need 97 or 99 percent confidence every time we conduct a new uh, test on a different sample. But for social science research, generally, uh, P is less than 0 0.05 is adequate. And uh, when we say P is less than 0 0.05, this is essentially the same as choosing a significance level, alpha, for a particular test. For example, we decide either to reject the null hypothesis if the test statistic exceeds the critical value, it is alpha at 0.05, or analogously to reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is smaller than 0.05. As I mentioned, most statistical software, such as Winx, report p-values rather than critical values, and all you really need to know is whether or not the p-value that's computed by a particular test is less than 0.05. And Winks will actually tell you whether or not the null hypothesis uh, can be rejected based on the p-value that each statistical test computes. It's important to remember that in research, we use statistics to communicate. So whether or not we reject the null hypothesis at a particular alpha level, that is P is less than 0 0.05, is how we communicate our research using numbers or statistics. By simply rejecting or even failing to reject a null hypothesis on this basis, and an appropriate statistical test tells our audience something about the sample and hopefully about the population that we're studying. When we're reporting results, we're basically using statistics as a language to communicate. When we gather samples for research, we are again trying to represent the total population. And inevitably, when we collect samples, we can commit sample errors. By conducting research on a representative sample, we may encounter sample errors because the sample is not the whole population. We can try very hard to sample in a representative way, but ultimately uh, we will always fall short because we cannot survey every single person in the entire population. Other errors that might uh, occur when we're sampling include a poor sampling method. So how do we actually determine who should participate in the study? Problems with our surveyor instrument, which will obviously skew the results if our questions are poorly worded or our instrument is not validated or behavioral effects, which skew the data for participants in the sample. So was there undue influence on the participants? How was the location where the survey was conducted? Were they distracted and so on and so forth? But generally we can say that the larger the sample size, and we call sample size in statistics uh, N, the more accurately it represents the population. And so, if we get a larger sample that's more representative of the population, we can have more confidence in our results. In social science research, it's tempting to rely on p-values alone, especially because the statistical software will compute p-values so easily. But p-values do not tell the whole story. We also have to consider effect size. Effect size is a simple way of quantifying the difference between two groups that has many advantages over the use of tests of statistical significance, that is, p-values alone. Effect size emphasizes the size of the difference, regardless of the sample size. And the statistician Cohen uh, came up with a value called d to represent effect size. And Cohen said this, that d of 0.2 is considered a small effect size, a d of 0.5 is a medium effect size, and a d of 0.8 is a large effect size. So what this means is that if two groups means don't differ by 0.2 standard deviations or more, the difference is trivial, even if it is statistically significant. So we might get a p-value that tells us that it's statistically significant, but if the effect size uh, is not greater than 0.2 standard deviations or more, that is Cohen's D, uh, then we have to question the results. So combining p-values and effect size give us a much more holistic picture of whether or not uh, the hypothesis that we've, uh, the null hypothesis we've rejected um, is meaningful. We also need to consider statistical power. Power is the probability that a test rejects the null hypothesis when the alternate hypothesis is true.
Generally, power is specified at 0 0.80 or 80% probability. That means it's accurate 80% of the time that a test will yield a statistically significant effect if it's actually there. So in other words, if, if we know that there is a statistically significant effect in the question we're asking, in the, in the hypothesis we're posing, the null hypothesis we're testing, we, we need to know that 80% of the time it's going to find that effect and, and find a statistically significant p-value less than 0.05 if it's actually there. This means we have an 80% chance of ending up with a p-value of less than 0.05, and that is 95% confidence in a statistical test. Power is the statistical muscle of being able to detect effects in your sample if they are truly there and truly representative of the population. So you can try to remember that in terms of power and muscle. And Winks will, will report the power of a particular statistical test. Aside from sampling errors, there are two other types of errors that can occur in statistical tests, type 1 and type 2 errors. Type 1, a false positive occurs when we incorrectly reject a true null hypothesis. Your findings occurred by chance. Type 2, a false negative occurs when we fail to reject a null hypothesis when it is really false. Your findings are significant, but you think they occurred by chance. We want to try to minimize both of these types of errors, but they are inversely proportional. That is, decreasing a type 1 error rate increases a type 2 error rate, and vice versa. There are some practical ways we can mitigate these errors of getting these false positives and false negatives. First, we can minimize the risk for a type 1 error by using a lower value for p. And we can minimize a type 2 error by increasing our sample size. So in other words, if we want to try to lower the type 1 error, we may have to make p even less than 0 0.0, less than less than 0 0.05. So maybe p would be um, less than uh, 0 0.01. And that would help us mitigate the risk of a type 1 error. A type 2 error can be uh, mitigated by increasing um, sample size. Now that we've discussed some of the fundamentals of statistical testing, let's talk about the practical steps of performing and interpreting a statistical test. Number one, state a null hypothesis and usually an alternate hypothesis. And if those are well written and clear, then we know exactly what we need to test and we should know which test we need to use. Number two, test the hypothesis using the right statistical test. And of course, we mean there the null hypothesis. And number three, interpret the test and make a decision using a decision criterion, usually the p-value, based on the assumption the null hypothesis has been satisfied. Typically, the reported p-value is the most convenient way to decide on statistical significance. For most cases, if the p-value is less than 0.05, you reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternate hypothesis. In quantitative research, there are several basic types of statistical tests. The first is called an analysis of variance, and this is essentially a comparison of the means of two or more samples, and we want to know if those means between those samples are different. This is sometimes called a repeated measures test, and you'll see this uh, also um, expressed as an ANOVA, A-N-O-V-A. So we're testing the means of particular samples, uh, two or more samples, to see um, if they're different. T-tests are common for uh, statistically significant difference between two groups from the same sample. So we may take a sample, split the sample on some independent variable, such as uh, ethnicity or job status or socioeconomic status uh, or, ra or race or gender or something like that, and uh, then test that split sample uh, against one another to see if the means are different. And uh, this is often done in quasi-experimental research, and it's called quasi-experimental research because there's no intervention, there's no treatment, but uh, the groups are split not as a randomly placed control group 
versus a, a uh, observational group, but the groups are split on the basis of some independent variable, which is usually a, a demographic variable. And so we can essentially test between two things using just one sample. A goodness of fit is sometimes called a chi-square test. And what we're looking for here is to see if our data, that is the sample, fit the expected data from the population. And we may have data about the population, especially if we're using archival data, that we're testing our sample against. Correlational studies is to test the strength of a relationship, if any, between two dependent variables. And it's very important to remember that in a correlational study, you are looking for a relationship between two dependent variables. So you cannot do a, a correlational study like you would a, a t-test or a, a significant difference study where you're splitting it on some uh, demographic variable. Uh, a correlation needs to be two different things. So for example, in, in my research, we might look at intrinsic religiosity and organizational religiosity and see if those two things correlate for a particular sample. Those are both dependent variables. And finally, we may look at a linear regression and linear regressions are actually predictive statistics. And what we end up with is a scatter plot of data and then we, uh, we estimate a linear equation. If you remember from high school algebra, a linear equation is how we plot a line, and it's usually in the form of y equals mx plus b. Now, sometimes we can get a curve also, and curves have exp exponents in their, in their equations. But uh, the, the point here is that we scatter plot our data, we come up with a formula, an equation, that, can, uh, that represents those data as they're plotted, and then we can actually use that to plug in other values and make predictions about how um, a dependent variable might uh, function when we manipulate a, another variable um, at some other point or one value increases as another value increases or so on and so forth. So think of, think of a line on a graph and we can uh, go to a particular point on the x or y axis and find the corresponding value. So the, this is an overview of the basic types of statistical tests that we might encounter. In the previous tutorial, we briefly touched on the idea of parametric and non-parametric tests in the context of normal distributions. Non-parametric tests are useful as an alternative to parametric tests when you suspect that the data are not normal or that variances between groups are unequal. And Winx has the ability to compute whether or not your sample data are normally distributed. And you can use that calculation to determine which kind of test you need to use for which purpose. So independent group t-tests, one-way ANOVA, paired t-tests, repeated measures ANOVA are all significant difference tests. And each one of them has their non-parametric equivalents if, if your data are not normally distributed. So that's the Mann Whitney U, the Kruskal Wallace, the Wilcox and Signed Rank, and the Friedman's ANOVA. And by and large, unless you have a very large sample size, you're going to end up using non-parametric tests in your dissertation uh, research. Then if you're doing a correlational study, Pearson's product moment of correlation is the parametric test and Spearman's rank correlation coefficient is the non-parametric equivalent. The chi-square, which is the goodness of fit test, stands on its own and that's used primarily for nominal data. At the beginning of this tutorial, we reviewed some of the questions we have to ask when choosing a statistical test and let's review those again. Number one, what are my hypotheses actually testing? Number two, which level of data does my instrument use? Nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio data? Number three, are my data normally distributed? Number four, what effect size is required for the test I'm choosing? And number five, what is the minimum p-value required to reject a null hypothesis? And by and large, that's going to be p is less than 0.05. Well, we've covered a lot of concepts in this tutorial, so I'd like to pause for a knowledge check. Let's reflect on these questions. Number one, why is a null hypothesis important? Why is the burden of proof on the researcher? Number two, how are type one and type two errors related? How can they each be minimized? 
Number three, why is power important in sampling? Number four, what does the p-value tell us? How does it inform hypothesis testing? Number five, why does effect size help us paint a more holistic picture of our data? And number six, how do we choose between parametric and non-parametric procedures?